So this is a joint work with Chad Hazlett, also from UCLA. And today I want to talk to you about uh, sensitivity analysis to unobserved confounders. And I think we, we had a great example today of what happens when you're studying observational data is that you always have that doubt that did you actually control for everything? So while Garrett was presenting, Graham asked, oh, but did you consider this variable? And the problem is that variable is not observed. So how can we discipline the discussion about this certainly unobserved confounders we have out there that could affect our results? So uh, could they be strong enough to change our results? Can, and, and how can we make, can we have simple tools to make this discussion of an observed confounding easy to do and routine, like part of our routine analysis, routine reporting? So to make things concrete, I want to start with a real example. I think it's easier to, to get things with a real example. So I want to start with a, with a real example. And I'm going to use an example for political science. Uh, but whenever I'm speaking about outcomes and treatments and confounders and covariates, I want you to think about your own research question. I'm using this example because it's easier to illustrate with a real example because I'm going to use because sensitivity analysis requires expert knowledge and I'm, I'm going to use uh, some of this knowledge here in this example. So our research question is, <clears throat> how did exposure to violence change individual attitudes toward peace in the context of violence in Darfur during 2003 and 2004? So does being exposed to violence make you angry and wanting revenge or does it make you wary and wanting peace, right? And this is a causal question, so you need an identification story and in this case, it goes as follows. So we had an indiscriminate bombing and attacks by the Janjaweed militia. So you can consider that the violence within village was as if random, except potentially uh, on gender because unfortunately you had many sexual assaults during these attacks. So your identification strategy requires you to condition on village uh, and condition on female and then you're going to identify the cause or effect of being directly harmed on your attitude toward peace. But when you submit your publication to the journal, uh, reviewer two thinks that you really should have controlled for center. Because if you live on the center, you're more likely to be attacked. And also people on center are systematically different and they have different attitudes toward peace. So, oops, sorry. So you should have controlled for that. Uh, wait a second, let me try to, I think it's common too. All right, yeah, I, th I think I fixed it. That's fine. And yeah. no, that's good, yeah, all right. So you should, no, that's fine, thank you. So you should have control for center. So instead of running this regression, you should have run this regression. But we have a problem here because center is not observed. So what can you do now, right? So the story, uh, illustrates a common thing in causal inference is that for identification you need to have unprovable stories about the absence of observed confounders, right? You can't prove it. For example, when you're doing IV, you have to ex assume that the instrumental variable is not compounded and also the exclusion restriction that doesn't affect directly your... So any, any causal inference method requires unprovable stories about unobserved confounders. And the truth is, unfortunately, is that hardly anyone will believe these stories hold exactly, uh, they are exactly true. And discussing identification assumptions in a qualitative manner only gets us so far. So you could say, yeah, you should have included this. And I say, yeah, I should, but would it matter? So we need to change the discussion from qualitative statements to a quantitative statement. So we need tools to, to have a quantitative discipline discussion about the sensitivity of our estimates when uh, these stories, uh, the stories we came up for identification are called into question, okay? So what I want to show you today are simple tools, simple tools to address several sensitivity questions for linear models using only the information already computed by your regression. So you don't need to make any extra modeling assumptions. And these are the questions I want to answer. So first, how strong would a particular confounder have to be to change your conclusions. In a worst case scenario, how vulnerable is our, is our result to many or all unobserved confounders acting together, possibly non-linearly? 
Third one, this is the most difficult one. Uh, are these confounders or scenarios plausible? And how strong would they have to be relative to the observed covariates? And finally, can we present these sensitivity results concisely for ease routine reporting? Because you could have a very interesting sensitivity method, but if it's too complicated to compute, when you're reading a paper, you can't, you can't as a reviewer, you can't compute yourself to ask the author, or when you're writing your paper, it might be too much trouble, you don't understand it very well. So we want something that be simple and concise that you can do for routine reporting. So what I'm going to do now is actually first present these methods in the, in the example I gave you. And then if, if we have the time, I will show you a little bit of the math because it's actually simple. Uh, so I think it's worth showing because it's for the economists here in the political sciences, it's something you're already familiar to. We just are reparametrizing some of the things. So what's in a regression table, right? Uh, so this is your familiar regression table when you, when you are reading papers or seeing conference, or like presentations of other people. This is what usually they show. So in our case here, we have the direct harm effect and the coefficient was 0 0.097, which is actually quite big for this context. And we have a standard error of 0 0.23. This estimate is statistically significant, but does it tell you anything about the sensitivity of the estimate to an observed confounder, for example, in our case, center. So how strong would center have to be to flip this estimate? It's not obvious here in this table uh, to how to answer this question, but it turns out everything you need is here. You just need to know where to look at. So this is our proposal for minimal reporting for transparency of the sensitivity of your results. So here I'm replicating this, the estimate, the standard errors and the t-values, and I'm only asking you to compute two more things. And you can get that from the regression table. You just need to know how to compute it. The first one is the partial R square of the treatment with the outcome, right? So the partial, for those, uh, just explaining what it means, the partial R square of the treatment with the outcome is how much of the residual variance your treatment explain after having taken into account what, what the covariates explain, okay? And the other thing I want you to show me is this thing we're calling the robustness value. <laughs> and I'll explain what it means right now. So only these two things, they already tell you a lot about the sensitivity of your estimate. So for instance, the robustness value in the context of Darfur here, tell us that if confounders, if confounders explained 13.9% of the residual variance of the treatment and 13.9% of the residual variance of the outcome, this would be sufficient to explain away the effect, okay? And it also tells you that if you think the confounder can't explain 13.9 of both the treatment and the outcome, then you're safe. It, it, this confounder would not explain away your effect. So we answer the first question. This, this robustness value already gives you a good idea of how strong your confounder would need to be, right? Now, why I'm asking you to also present a partial square of your treatment with the outcome? Because it turns out that this quantity here is also extreme scenario sensitivity analysis. So what is, what is this telling you? If, if you had a super confounder that explained 100% of the residual variance of your outcome, this is exactly what you need to explain of your treatment to explain away your effect, okay? So if you consider the extreme scenario where you gathered all possible confounders together and explained, had a deterministic relationship with your outcome, you could explain everything, this is how strongly related it would need to be with your treatment to explain away your effect. So we answered the second question now of the extreme sensitivity analysis, right? So these two things already gave you uh, a general idea of how strong your confounder needs to be and, uh, and an extreme scenario sensitivity analysis. But now you're gonna ask, all right, so you gave me this 2.2 .2 and this 13.9, but are this, is this too little? Is this a lot, right? So, so this is the hard part of the, the, of the sensitivity analysis. So it's not easy to answer that. And this is where, for most data analysis, where expert knowledge has to come in. So this is not a statistical question. This is an expert knowledge problem. And we're, we're gonna try to help you think about that. And if you have reasons to believe that you measured an important confounder, or an important covariate, sorry, we can bound the strength of the confounder. Okay, and for example, if you look here at the right corner, we have 
a benchmark bound. And what this is saying is, our estimate would be robust to a compounder as strong as female. Because if we think the compounder is, not, is as strong as female, then the compounder could at most explain 12% of your outcome and 1% of your treatment. And in, also, your, your estimate is, uh, is robust to a super compounder as a, not super compounder, worst case compounder, as associated with the treatment as female, because female is only 1% and your partial R square is 2.2%. Is this good news? Only experts can tell. So in this case here, so that's why I brought a real world example, you could argue for, for instance, that female is a very strong predictor of the, out, uh, of the treatment assignment. Because first, it's a visual characteristic of the individual, so when the militia is attacking, they can tell whether you're female or male, and also they had a special interest to attacking females because of the sexual assault. So in this case, you have strong reasons to believe that this is one of the, your strongest uh, covariates. So maybe you could make an argument here that it's hard to think there is anything as strong as, as this covariate. And all these results here, they are exact for single confounders, but they, you don't have to do anything else for multiple confounders. So they are uh, conservative for multiple confounders. Even uh, nonlinear multiple confounders are misspecification. If you forgot to, for example, add a square term of one of the covariates, you, you can put all into this account here. And you could also do this for T values, not only the, the F point estimate. So this is our minimal reporting that we are suggesting that people do to start spreading sensitivity analysis in empirical work. And we can see that we answered all the four questions here. So we have how strong your confounder needs to be, the extreme scenario. We have a benchmark bound giving you an idea of how strong it would need to be with this practice of observed covariates. And it's all in a very concise table. So as an investigator, you can use that to report like as a minimal requirement for both understanding and communicating the sensitivity of your results. As a reviewer or reader, you can use this to assess other papers because you can easily compute those quantities just putting up your phone and making the computation. So it's not something that requires simulation. It's easy to compute. You can start a discussion about sensitivity uh, with your peer. But we can do more. So now I'm going to show you three visualizations. Um, <laughs> so you can explore the whole sensitivity range of point estimates, of t-values, of confidence intervals. You can contemplate different bounds, and you can do also uh, less extreme scenarios than the one presented on the table. Okay? So this is the first sensitivity plot that I want to show you. So here on the x-axis, x -axis, <clears throat> we have the hypothetical partial R square of the observed confounder with the treatment. Here we have the hypothetical partial R square of the unobserved confounder with the outcome. So here is the scenario, like the good scenario of no confounding. That's what you're assuming when you present a regression table. And when you go in this direction, the confounder gets stronger, so your estimate eventually goes down to zero and flips its sign. All right, so here you have the whole range of what a confounder could do to your estimate. And I'm putting here two bounds. So first here we have the bound I presented you on the table, which is how strong would a confounder as strong as female be? And here I put another bound, which is how strong a confounder twice as strong as female would be. And in this case, you would still be, be kind of safe. So your estimate would be cut in half, but it would still be uh, a little bit far away from zero. So now in my answer, I'm showing only sensitivity or point estimates. What would happen to the statistical significance in this case? And you can do that too. So this is the sensitivity analysis of the statistical significance. And then here we see that it's not, it's trickier now the case. So our estimate would still be robust to a confounder as strong as female, but it would not, well, we cannot guarantee because this is a bound, we cannot guarantee it is robust to a confounder twice as strong as female, okay? So now, uh, now it's your job as an expert to argue against this case, or maybe to concede that this is the case and you cannot be sure and see what further steps you need to do in your research to, to rule out this thing, right? But we can see that we are moving from a qualitative discussion about confounding to a quantitative discussion. Like, is it plausible there is something twice as strong as me? What is it? Right, can you name it? So let's try to gather this information if it's possible or to assess external data that could have, give me an idea of how strong this is. 
and so on. And, and another plot that I want to show you is this uh, extreme scenarios plot. Uh, in the x-axis, we have the partial, hypothetical partial square of the observed confounder with the treatment. And here now we have the adjusted estimate. So the top estimate here is your original estimate. And as you go down, your estimate eventually reaches zero and flips its sign. And then we have different uh, extreme scenarios of the partial square of the compounder with the outcome. So this dash, the solid black line here, is, is the one that corresponds to the partial square with the treatment that I presented on the table, right? But you could say, okay, this is too extreme. I wanted to see a confounder that explains not 100%, but 80% of 50%, or this 41%, which is all the covariates on your data together, right? So it's a reference point, for example. And as, as I have shown on the table there, you can see, so I put the benchmarks. So here is the bound of the how much a confounder could explain if it was as strong as female, and here if it was twice as strong as female. And you can see that the point estimate is quite robust to these confounders. But as, as we have seen, the statistical significance is not that robust, okay? So this is a sample of the kind of visualizations you can do in addition to that minimal reporting that we are suggesting, right? That already tells you a lot to start with. <coughs> and now, uh, I wanna show you some parts of the derivation. Uh, and the reason I wanna show you, it's because it's for the economists here and for the political scientists here, is that we're only reparametrizing something you already know, something you're familiar with, which is the omitted very bias formula, okay? <clears throat> so if you formalize the problem, it's basically this. So we have a true model in which your outcome is a linear function of your treatment D, of your covariates X, and of your confounder Z. If you had measured all the variables, you would run the full regression with the uh, three sets of covariates. But since you don't observe Z, you're actually forced to estimate a restricted regression omitting uh, of forcing this coefficient to be zero or meeting the, the, the z variable. And our question is, how much does including z matter? How much does it change our results? And formally, what we're asking is, how does the coefficient we wish we had estimated compares to the one we were forced to estimate? Or how is the standard error we wish we had estimated compares to the one we actually estimated? And the answer to the first question is actually well known, it's just, the traditional omitted very biased formula. So if you partial out the covariates from your treatment and your outcome, you can get that the bias is a product of two regression coefficients. <laughs> One that we can intuitively call impact, which is the coefficient of regressing your confounder on the outcome, having partialing out for your treatment and your uh, covariates. And the other one that we call imbalance, when you regress your confounder with the treatment, having taken into account the effect of the covariates, okay? So this is traditional omitted very bias formula. It's a very good formula. If you have a good idea of your, what your confounder is, you can start using this for a sensitive analysis, but it has some drawbacks, which I'll not go further here because of time. So, and that's why you can actually reparameterize this in terms of partial or square. And the reparameterization is quite simple. We just take this, uh, this product of coefficients and rewrite them in terms of partial correlations. Okay, so partialing out the things and rewriting. And then we do the same thing for the standard errors, right? We just rewrite them in terms of partial standard deviations uh, and readjust for the degrees of freedom. And then if we combine these results, we get the expressions for the bias and for the standard errors in terms of the partial square of the confounder, okay? Uh, so these are the equations, the sensitivity equations for the contours and the extreme scenarios that I showed you. Uh, and it actually reveals some interesting things. So for example, wh why can we do like an extreme scenario, extreme sensitivity scenario? It's precisely because the bias, so it depends on the partial square of the treatment, uh, uh, the partial square of the confounder with the outcome. Via this partial correlation, which you can bound by one, it doesn't blow up the bias. But in terms of the treatment, it depends on actually the F statistic, which is unbounded in terms of the partial correlation. So uh, you can't do an extreme scenario with the treatment because if you put this to one, this bias goes to infinity, right? And the standard error formula is also very intuitive. It shows basically that you have a variance inflation, variance inflation factor 
a variance and reduction factor, and this part is the part that depends on the data. <coughs> but the good thing about this parameterization is that you can get those simple measures that I showed you on the table. So the first one is the partial R square itself. So if you ask yourself, how strong would the confounder need to be to explain away my estimated effect, you see that the partial R square of the confounder with the treatment and with the control would need to satisfy this relationship. And if you set this thing to one, this is exactly the value of the partial square of the treatment with the outcome. So this thing here, which we showed on the table, so how much your treatment explains of your outcome after taking into account the covariates is an extreme uh, sensitivity analysis, right? And the robustness values is the same thing, but now you're asking a different question. So uh, if, if we consider a confounder with equal association with the treatment and the outcome, necessary to explain away your effect, uh, what would be the strength it needs to have? And this gives you the robustness value, and you can see that robustness value is just a function of the partial square, again, of the treatment with the outcome. And why is this useful? Because it's easily compute, computable. You can compute from what you have in a regression table. And it gives you immediate transparency of causal assumptions. So if you have a robustness values of 1%, that means you know right away that you need to believe that there is nothing out there that explains 1% of your treatment and 1% of the outcome. <coughs> so you can maintain your causal claim. If you don't believe that, then you have to... Uh, uh, think twice about making a very strong claim about your, your estimate, causing inference of estimate. So that's basically it. I think we're actually good on time. I thought I was gonna go over, but. So the final remarks here. So uh, when you're dealing with observational data or, or with imperfect experiments, we need to be transparent about the causal assumptions going on when you're making these claims. So if we can't know for certain if our identification results hold, we need to, to tell the, the reader or tell ourselves how much, what is the amount of confounding necessary to change our conclusions, right? So we need to move from a qualitative discussion to a quantitative discussion. So the purpose of our tools is to make this task easier uh, and using only information from a regression model and using the omitted variables bias framework that you're already familiar with we can compute simple sensitivity measures of point estimates and t-values, either for routine reporting or when you're reading or reviewing papers. You can use the same framework for single or multiple confounders and also for extreme scenarios. So you, the same computations you're making holds for both. And you can explore a series of visualizations to help thinking whether confounders that change your answer can be ruled out or not. And just the usual, uh, caveat is that assessing the plausibility of such confounders heavily re relies on expert knowledge. So it's not something you can delegate to the computer or to the statistician. That's something you need to argue. And it might not be easy to do that because you might find out that you don't know whether you can rule out that confounder or not. But learning that is important as well, right? And I think we're in a conference about transparency, so I don't think we should uh, be trying to fool our audience or fool ourselves that we, we don't know, okay? And everything that I'm saying here is going to be on a software soon, I hope, maybe next week. And you can run on your R uh, and check out the, the tables and the visualizations and uh, do your sensitivity analysis. And I want to see what you think, if you think it's useful or not. All right. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Um, so are you assuming uh, no interaction between u and x? Um, and also, are you assuming a linear functional form between uh, u and y as well? So, uh, this is, so the thing is, this is just basically an algebraic derivation of sensitivity of regression coefficients. So uh, if you had, so let's take a, a linear model here. So if, if you had an interaction of z and x, that doesn't matter. It, 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 it goes into the account of the conf total confounding you are computing. So you need to think how much could everything together explains of your treatment and of your outcome. 
The tricky thing is if you consider an interaction of D and X or D and Z, because then you need to think about sensitivity of more than one coefficient, not, not, o not only the treatment assignment co coefficient. So in this case, it's harder, and, and we actually still don't know what is the best way to approach and, and to present these results. Does that answer your question? Yeah, um, and it looks like you, you do also have a linear functional form assumed between uh, Z and Y, right? No, you don't need that. You don't need that? No, so the, so, so the thing is, if you assume linear function for Z and Y, then the result is exact. If the, if the functional form of Z is not linear, then the result is a conservative bound. I see. Okay. okay. Which is, it seems like, uh, so in a similar method, um, let's say, so Altone, Gielder, and Tabor, and, uh, and Emily Oscar. Oscar's method that's similar, there's sort of uh, a, a bound, or a, a cutoff of one, where people, so they're, they're, for people who aren't familiar with this, this is sort of, uh, you can compute a relative selection. So in Oster's methods, it's, it's delta. And so you're like, how much selection into treatment is there based on observables? And then how much sub, uh, uh, selection into treatment based on unobservables would there have to be to make this result be, become insignificant? And so the ratio of selection the ratio of selection, they sit like their sort of uh, argument is that because we typically, like when we're collecting observational data, we're trying to control for as much as we can. So maybe the observables are, you know, that we, we gather an income because we wanted to control for socioeconomic status or we wanted to control for ability. So we like had an IQ test and like obviously those aren't perfect, but we controlled for the best thing we could actually observe. So the, the uh, sort of casual or informal cutoff is that there's a ratio, that the, this ratio, if it's greater than one, then you're sort of in safe territory because you're controlling for the best things you can. And so it's unlikely that there would be worse, you know, stronger selection into treatment on the unobservables than the uh, observables. And is there anything in here that sort of that, I don't know, a cutoff like that, or, or, or are you arguing no. strictly like the expert knowledge for each specific? Yeah, so, uh, so here we are not trying to give uh, like a, a cutoff like this. So what we're trying to give you is how to compute this bound. So uh, for example, if you're interested in point estimate, so uh, here you could see that you could tolerate something twice as strong as your, your observed covariate in the point estimate, but not in the T value. So what you can do is explore how strong something need to be relative to where you, uh, what you observed and see if that's plausible or not. But now this is always a judgment call because that's exactly what you said. So for example, if you're measuring IQ as a proxy for ability or something, could you think, okay, that's why it's the partial R square, right? So how much could ability itself explain after taking into account uh, what I already measure with IQ. So is, is it as much as IQ itself or is it twice as much? And unfortunately for this thing here, we can't do anything better than uh, you having a good theory why you think that what you observe is good or, or using external data sources too. That, that could be something that gives you an idea of how strong something could be. But yeah. Uh, 